I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a round table, technically, although it looks like a hearing of the Committee of the Whole. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. And this is the Committee of the Whole of the Council of the District of Columbia. Today is Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. The time is 4.30, excuse me, 4.41 in the afternoon. Uh, we are conducting this hearing live via the Zoom video conference broadcast platform, as well as Council Channel, Cable Channel 13, as well as um, the Council's website, which is uh, www.dccouncil.us. Subject of this hearing, which is the second of three hearings we're having this afternoon, the third hearing will follow immediately upon completion of this hearing. This hearing concerns six nominations by the mayor to the Commission on the Arts and Humanities. And the nominations are PR, Proposed Resolution 23-900, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Cronice Floyd Confirmation Resolution of 2020, PR 23-901, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Maggie Fitzpatrick Confirmation Resolution of 2020, PR 23-902, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Maria Hall Rooney, Confirmation Resolution 2020. PR 23-903, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Hector Torres, Confirmation Resolution of 2020. PR 23-904, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Carla Sims, Confirmation Resolution of 2020. And PR 23-905, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Stacy Lee Banks, Confirmation Resolution of 2020. Of these six individuals, Three are reappointments and three uh, would be first time appointments. Carla Sims, Hector Torres, and Maggie Fitzpatrick would all be appointed for the first time, assuming the council confirms the mayor's nominations. The Commission on Arts and Humanities has been in existence since the late 1970s. A year ago, over a year ago, the commission became an independent agency of the District of Columbia government. The commission evaluates and initiates action on matters and gives grants relating to the arts and humanities and encourages programs and the development of programs that promote the arts and humanities in the District of Columbia. The record in this matter will be open for just under two weeks. That is, it will close at noon on November 9th of next month. Uh, so anybody who is testifying today, and I have only the nominees signed up, uh, and wants to uh, submit additional or is requested to submit additional materials as until noon, November 9th. Anybody else who wishes to comment for the record has to file by noon on November 9th. Well, why don't we let the um, nominees in? I say it that way because my understanding is that with this Zoom technology, everybody's in a waiting room until we let them in. And it's good to see you all. Um, I'm gonna begin with Quanice Floyd and move through the, um, the list. And then I'll have some questions for you. I believe I received statements from each of you. And just today I received uh, the responses to the questions that we had sent. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Ms. Floyd, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Good afternoon. Oh, there you are. Uh, so why don't you proceed? And then you will be uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Great. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Kwanis Floyd. I'm a Ward 6 resident. I want to thank you for extending me the opportunity to appear before you today. I would also like to thank Mayor Bowser for her nomination for my reappointment to the Commission of the Arts and Humanities. Um, I've been a DC resident for 15 years since attending Howard University and after living in New York City for 18 years of my life, I vividly remember the excitement I felt when I when I was coming to DC. Um, I was excited to learn about a new city with new history and being exposed to new culture. Um, I remember listening to WPGC on AOL radio, yes I'm dating myself, and listening to go-go music. Uh, I was fascinated with go-go and I knew that DC was the place I needed to be. As a young musician, I heard the polyrhythmic patterns in the percussion and immediately felt a connection to the music, the culture, and the city. Of course, there was more that I had to learn once I arrived, but I looked forward to my new adventure in life. As an adolescent, my biggest goal was to become a music educator, to cultivate relationships with students, both inside and outside of the classroom, similar to Mr. Holland's opus, if you ever saw that movie. 
After I graduated with my bachelor's degree in music education, I pursued my education even further by attending Kent State and earning my master's in music ed as well. I also earned a master's degree in arts management from American University. During my studies, I was a full-time elementary music teacher where I taught general music, band, orchestra, chorus, and theory. Uh, as much as I love teaching, I knew I had a bigger calling beyond the four walls of my classroom. And after 10 years of teaching, I decided to take a leap of faith and transi transitioned into arts education advocacy. In my current position as the executive director of arts education in Maryland schools, I serve as a lobbyist for the state of Maryland where I advocate for access to high quality arts education for all 900,000 students in Maryland's public school system. In this role, I have rooted myself in the concept of arts education being a civil and human right. The arts provide creativity, collaboration, connection, and more. And the fact that some students don't have access to the arts in their schools in particular is an act of violence. The last time I stood before you, I told you that the arts and culture are everywhere and that is still true to this day. So I have a question for everyone in here. When the quarantine first began, how many of you watched TVs or movies? That's the arts. How many of you watched or participated in a Zoom dance or a chorus class? That's the arts. The arts are there for us when we needed it the most and we all, need, we all use the arts to cope and heal. Now it's our turn to be there for the arts. And since COVID-19 began, artists and arts organizations have taken a huge hit. The arts sector went dark here in DC until it began adapting to the virtual world. There are artists who are continuing to struggle and I know firsthand about these artists' experiences. This year, I started an emergency fund for black, indigenous, and people of color artists from all over the country through an organization I founded called the Arts Administrators of Color Network. And we provided many grants of $200. We've had over 15,000 applications nationally and we are still collecting applications to this day. The arts are hurting right now. The artists are hurting right now and people are hurting right now. Serving on the commission these past two years has opened my eyes to how deeply rooted the systemic issues and inequities are within the arts and culture sector. This work has shown me that there are still inequitable practices happening in the district. And I hope to make sure that we work together to ensure that our residents have the same opportunities. I've heard some commissioners talk about how we need to bring arts to certain communities, but the arts and culture is already there. We just need to bring the resources to those artists so that they can continue doing the amazing work that they're doing there. I will continue to work with other commissioners to provide equity and access for all communities. I hope to assist the commission in its current initiatives, including providing grant funding uh, programs, educational activities that encourage racially and culturally diverse artistic expression, as well as preserve the city's longstanding history in the arts. I also hope to advance the arts and culture's presence so that people can become more aware of the opportunities available to them through the commission. I'm extremely excited and honored to continue volunteering my time for this commission because it allows me to showcase my passion for the arts and arts education and the opportunity to represent and help my community. I appreciate the opportunity to share with the committee today and if confirmed, I look forward to continuing to work with the commission. Thank you for your consideration for my nomination and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Floyd. Uh, so I will have some questions, but let's, let's go through all the uh, nominees. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Maggie Fitzpatrick and I'm pleased to appear before you today as a nominee for appointment to the District of Columbia Commission on the Arts and Humanities. First, I hope you all are remaining well and staying safe during this pandemic. I would be remiss, Mr. Chairman, if I didn't thank you for all that you and the Council are doing for the citizens of the district during this unprecedented and truly difficult time. There are members of the district community that are losing their jobs and who are confronting illness, some without health care. And I know that you all are on the front lines doing all you can for all of us and we are all grateful. So thank you for that. I'd like to express my appreciation to Mayor Bowser for nominating me to the commission. I'm eager to offer my experience and expertise in support of public service particularly now when artists and our arts organizations have been so adversely impacted during the pandemic. I moved to DC and took a job in the federal government several decades ago after completing degrees in policy and English at Syracuse University. Shortly after I enrolled in the GW University Master's Program of Public Policy and Women's Studies. 
Before completing my degree, I was a research fellow at the United States Library of Congress and completed my graduate research work on diversity in the arts. I was fortunate to work in the office of the first ever female poet laureate of the United States. In preparation for this hearing, I have reflected on my decades in Washington and I've thought about what it is about the city that has drawn me here and what has made me stay. The answer is the community and the culture and the deep and lasting tradition of excellence in the arts that continues to be built upon by our DC artists today. From our rich history from Duke Ellington and, and Shirley Horn, whose jazz enlivened the U Street corridor to the unmatched blend of funk, rhythm and blues and hip hop, which is now DC's homegrown go-go. Washington has cemented a reputation as a city with soul as home to dance educators whose curricula are used nationwide, to critically acclaimed regional theaters whose productions have fueled successful Broadway runs, and the internationally recognized Kennedy Center, which is at once a vibrant presenting organization, an active monument distinguishing performance arts from around the globe. Washington, D.C. showcases its cultural innovators some of the most effective diplomats in our nation's capital. By offering its buildings, its streets and sidewalks as a canvas for public art installations in the mural. Washington also values public art and celebrates the role muralists and street artists play in engendering citizen participation in our dyna dynamic neighborhoods. Most recently, those public art installations reminded us importantly, that Black Lives Matter. DC's arts and cultural organizations are striving to reflect our diversity while increasing awareness, understanding, and economic value. I celebrate all of these organizations and the work that they undertake each day on behalf of Washington residents and beyond. As a board member of two local nonprofits, the Arena Stage and the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center, I have learned the value of organized, organizational strength in the arts in our communities. Both the Tennis and Learning Center and ARENA have successful community outreach programs. I'm sure, Mr. Chairman, you've witnessed the beauty of Flax and Wax, which most recently is reminding us all to vote. And we've also had a significant amount of accomplishment with our artist fellowship program in ARENA. I have come to clearly understand how critically important these community programs are to engaging our citizens and particularly our young citizens. It is clear the Commission on the Arts and Humanities has a unique opportunity to elevate the work of our many talented creative residents from dance, music, theater, spoken word, public art, and so many other rich genres of human expression. Since July of 2020, I've had the honor of serving on the Commission's task force on diversity, inclusion, and belonging. During this engagement, I have observed how arts funding could be better optimized and how important insights from the commission's many stakeholders will drive more equitable and impactful funding programs as we move forward. It is clear there is more work to do and all efforts must be made to continuously improve on the dimensions of inclusion and equity that are underway. I am pleased to help lead this work, particularly when race and diversity are urgently at the forefront of our national priorities. And so many voices around the city have galvanized for long overdue equity, fairness, and justice. I'm confident my personal and professional experience will provide an important perspective as the commission works to operationalize a more inclusive approach to fulfilling its mission. I have firsthand knowledge of the kind of rigor that is required to effectively deploy millions of dollars to spark artistic excellence and drive positive economic and social benefits. As a leader overseeing corporate affairs programs and corporate foundations at top Fortune 100 companies, I had the oversight of philanthropic giving to artists and arts organizations. In those roles, I worked collaboratively with community leaders to identify funding needs and leverage investments to build stronger and more inclusive programs through public and private partnerships. 
I've observed the many ways arts funding can have a multiplier effect, positively addressing some other ancillary pressing social needs. The commission has the important role of ensuring that the arts and humanities are bolstered and supported and that we invest in organizations and individuals to build on our time honored tradition of excellence. I'm grateful to all of the public servants on the council and the commission who are driving progress and opportunity for district residents. It would be an incredible honor, Mr. Chairman, for me to join them and you as we continue to work to build greater impact, equity and inclusion in our arts programs and to lead the nation in advancing and supporting our homegrown artists while continuing to power our dynamic creative economy during this uniquely challenging time. Thank you for your time today and for considering me for this important role. It would be my distinct honor to serve. Again, I'm very grateful to Mayor Bowser for this nomination and for your consideration. And I welcome any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Uh, Ms. Rooney. Hi, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. This is Mariah Hall Rooney and my husband, Greg Rooney will be reading my testimony for me because I have a, a visual impairment. I hope that's acceptable to uh, the council. Sure. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, members of the committee as a whole. My name is Mariah Rooney and I'm extremely honored to be nominated by Mayor Bowser to serve another term as commissioner for DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Thank you very much uh, for this committee also for the opportunity to testify today. Much of my professional career has been spent producing educational programs for museums and historic sites in collaboration with contemporary artists, museum directors, curators, and art educators. I've also had the opportunity to create hundreds of educational programs for museums across North America. I've worked with multimedia firm Antenna Audio for Discovery Communications and principled my own arts education and communication consulting company. By far the most rewarding programs I've produced were ones for children. They are particularly creative to make and I get a great delight watching groups of school students react and engage with artwork as they have just walked, as they would have just walked by otherwise. I moved to the district 15 years ago with my husband who was born and raised in the district. We have two daughters who attend Wilson High School. When I was a child, my parents brought me to this city to visit the Kennedy Center and the Smithsonian Museums and the Corcoran Gallery of Art to, make, to mention a few. These trips were incredibly memorable and helped shape my future career in the arts. Washington DC has always been and will always be an amazing center for cultural activity. What I've come to appreciate today as a resident and as a commissioner is the breadth and diversity of creative enterprises in this city. At the same time, it has become abundantly clear that we must make additional efforts to expand arts and humanity initiatives and collaborations for all of our underserved com communities. As a commissioner, it's my duty to ensure this legacy of creativity continues to grow and flourish. DC has a very diverse population, but many dis disparities exist. The commission needs to ensure that all communities are included in the work we do and are aware of the grants we offer in order to encourage engagement and increase opportunities for the constituents we serve. I have become involved with many arts and cultural organizations over the years, including Transform Gallery, that fosters the centers of local emerging, ta emerging talents, Step Africa that promotes dance and scholarships for DC students, Arts on the Block that offers young artists entrepreneurial and professional training, and also a, a founding co-chair of the War for Humanities and Culture Advisory Committee that supports artists and arts and humanity organizations in my neighborhood in Ward 4. I've had the opportunity to serve on several committees throughout my work at the commission. As a current member of the commission's grant committee, I bring grant writing experience, having written proposals for art reach, the ARC, and for visual arts engagement programs for DCPS middle school students. One of the most rewarding achievements for our grants committee this year was being able to offer many artists relief grants for work that had been negatively impacted because of the COVID-19. 
artists from all eight wards benefit from this initiative. And I think the commission as a whole is very proud of it. One of the commission's program goals for the last several years was to grow the public art program. With that in mind, it's been my pleasure to bring my background in art history and museum administration to the commission's public art committee. By convening and overseeing bank panels, I had the art bank panels, I had the gratifying experience of helping to grow DC's fine art collection while also supporting the DC's creative economy and local arts. Through my tenure at the commission, I've come to appreciate the commission staff who are incredibly able, hardworking, and dedicated, and dedicated to their work. Acting, acting director, executive director, Haran Sarek Braun has done an admirable job of leading an agency with strength and intelligence. We are lucky to have her guidance and that of chairperson Kate Kendall, who is a tireless champion for the organization and for the arts. In closing, I'd like to say that the arts and humanities are not extras or specials, but essential to a rich and full life. <clears throat> An engaged and creative citizenry in a vibrant and thriving diverse city. Over the years, the commission's commitment to local artists and arts and humanity organizations has helped DC develop into a vital cultural center it is today. I'd be greatly honored to continue my work on the commission to help support creative gro growth in this exciting city that I call home. Thank you again for the opportunity to present today and look forward to happy, happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rooney. Uh, Mr. Torres. Hector Torres. You are muted. Unmute. Thank you. I'm sorry. All right. Um, as I said good before, afternoon. good afternoon. I apologize. Um, I, well, good afternoon. Let me start it over. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. I am truly honored to come before you uh, as a nominee for appointment to the District of Columbia Commission on Arts and Humanities. I take this opportunity to thank Mayor Muriel Bowser for the nomination, Jose Ucles, the current commissioner, for his enthusiastic support, and this committee for considering my nomination. As a new member, I realize I have much to learn. I arrived at the District of Columbia in 1980 from New York City and have made DC my home ever since, all the time while a resident of beautiful, diverse Ward 6. I have been a hotel management executive in both locally owned and international hotel companies for over 48 years. I retired in 2018 when I sold our when we sold our hotel company, Capital Hotels. Now I am an independent artist painter. I'm a graduate of St. John's University with a degree in secondary art education. As fate would have it, upon graduation, the City of New York froze any and all hiring of the arts in the arts departments. I chose at the time to continue working in the hotel industry, where I had worked part time during college. Having made this decision, I turned my eye towards Washington, D.C. As Washington, D.C. presented a new and exciting opportunity in the hospitality industry, and the city had numerous opportunities to become re-engaged in and continue uh, pursuing my art and using it to benefit the community. Back in the 80s and early 90s, the AIDS pandemic was bringing significant challenges to our city. The Whitman Walker Clinic was at the forefront of the battle. Yet despite good intentions, the Latino community was left on the sidelines due to cultural and language barriers. My husband, Jay Haddock, was a member of the board of, of the Whitman Walker Clinic during this time. We gathered a group of local Latino artists and started what became a 10-year enterprise called Art for Life. Art for Life was a fundraising activity where local Latino artists and international artists donated artwork to raise funds and create culturally significant event to help those in the Latino community. 100% of the sales of every piece of art was donated to benefit the cause. Art in this reiteration served to save lives as services were created specifically to aid the Latino community. Over a period of 10 years, we raised nearly $1 million with 100% of the proceeds going to the 
going to the clinic to support and implement necessary programs. I have been a member of board of trustees for the Carlos Rosario International Charter School for five years. I have also been a board member of Gala Hispanic Theater, which enjoys the distinction of being the only Hispanic theater in our city and serves as a cultural bridge. I still serve on the advisory board and don't and advocate on their behalf. I have also served as chair of the board for Destination DC and Washington Performing Arts. As an artist of Puerto Rican descent, I have always used my art to support community programs by donating meaningful portion of my proceeds. For example, in 2018, I participated in an exhibit with a downtown bid to raise funds for homeless shelters. Similarly, I participated in an exhibit and raised funds for Children's National Hospital and their children's cultural programs. I believe that art in DC is a vital part, as we all do, of the culture and diversity and requires support and greater attention. While we have the Smithsonian Institution represented, DC local artists and their works are and continue to be the heart of this city's identity. As, as, as art shows the vibrancy of the city and it shows the expression for which ingenuity and make DC capital city that it is. We cannot be a city of sophistication and recognition without creating a true support for the arts. I, I extend my appreciation to you for the time afforded me today and for considering my nomination to this esteemed commission. I continue to wish everyone great health and strength during these most difficult of times. I welcome any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Uh, and uh, Carla Sims. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. Good afternoon. Council member, council members and staffs of the Committee of the Whole. I am honored to have been nominated by Mayor Muriel Bowser to serve as a commissioner on the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, and I'm happy to testify before you today. As a resident of Ward 6, I have lived on Capitol Hill for over 20 years. A previous career as an Army Reserve officer brought me to the area, but it's the cultural diversity and the thriving arts community um, <clears throat> that has kept me here. I am fortunate to be a part of this community and especially appreciative to the, for the opportunity to work with the commission. Art is at the intersection of both my personal life and professional career. I am married to jazz harmonicist Frederick Yanay and I represent famed comedian and DC native Dave Chappelle, both huge advocates in arts education. We all remember the trending of hashtag DC public schools following Dave's mention at the Emmys of the school system that helped raise that helped to shape him. In conjunction with the mayor's office, Duke Ellington School of the Arts, the Kennedy Center, the ARC, and other schools and organizations, I have sought to implement programs that fill gaps in arts instructions, ensure access to students, and inspire diverse artistic expression. In my previous position as senior vice president at the global PR firm of Fleischmann Hillard, I had the pleasure to work with the Arts Commission to produce cultural tourism initiatives, including the DC Film Festival, Party Animals, and Pandemanium. Most recently, I worked with the Department of Public Works, one of the commission's interagency partners, to develop the strategic plan for the mural arts program. As a communications consultant and three-time Grammy award-winning producer, I am confident I will be an asset to the commission and I will leverage my experience and resources to promote a vibrant, creative economy that expands opportunities for diversity, equity, and, and inclusion across all eight wards. While many of my employers have been within the private sector, I have worked with numerous nonprofits and government clients to develop their strategic outreach plans by marrying industry's best practices with innovative and often unprecedented approaches. As you know, the COVID-19 crisis has had a devastating impact on arts, culture, and the creative economy. It has forced us all to shift in ways previously unimagined. Layered with the social injustice and civil unrest, we seem to have reached a tipping point. However, as the past several months have shown us, the arts cannot be stifled. When the stress of isolation and uncertainty started to set in, the arts community jumped to the front lines using their craft to provide context, assurance, and hints of normalcy. We saw creativity out of necessity, when Frederick Yanet defined the walls of an empty house with plastic curtains to create a safe space for him and his band to rehearse. 
He invited his Capitol Hill neighbors to eavesdrop from their porches and the basic need to create proved to be therapy for an entire community. We saw creativity out of necessity when local arts organizations shifted their programming to streaming platforms so that the show could go on. And we saw creativity out of necessity when the mayor reclaimed our city streets from federal forces intent to intimidate peaceful protesters. I was fortunate to work with the mayor's office and the team at DPW to put a local, national, and international spotlight on what has become a safe haven for protesters and the most and the most replicated mural initiative in the world, Black Lives Matter Mural and Plaza. The mayor, the city council, and the arts commission have played a critical role during these times, and you all should be commended. As a body, you quickly recognized and acted with increased grant funding to curb the impact of the pandemic on the district's arts and cultural industries, <clears throat> thereby contributing to the sustainability of the sector. Beyond funding, these times require new ways of thinking. I trust that the commission will be just as creative as the artist. I look forward to working with the commission to pivot as necessary in the current year and to implement its new strategic plan after June, 2021. I am eager to find innovative approaches to support the sustainability of the sector, particularly among the underrepresented and underserved. To generate widespread recognition of DC as a place where all stakeholders are uplifted in their efforts to revive the creative economy. Thanks again for your consideration and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Ms. Sims. Uh, Ms. Banks. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee on the Whole. My name is Stacy Lee Banks, and it is with great pleasure uh, that I come before you today as a nominee for reappointment to the District of Columbia Commission on the Arts and Humanities. I would like to thank Mayor Muriel Bowser for the nomination and you, Chairman Mendelson, for holding this hearing. A lifetime resident of the District of Columbia of Columbia, I have a vested interest in the prosperity of our city. I attended Duke Ellington School of the Arts and McKinley High Schools, where I uh, played the flute in the bands at, at, at both places where we uh, played go-go music way back then in the 40, uh, 40 years ago. I uh, graduated from Howard University and am the third generation president and co-owner of Lee's Flower and Card Shop. Lee's is a 75 year old business established by my grandparents, William and Winifred Lee on historic U Street. I am a lifelong lover of the arts. Some of my fondest memories are of my dad taking me, my siblings and cousins to free, free arts events throughout the District of Columbia, including festivals, classical music concerts, museum exhibits, and the theater. This early exposure gave me an appreciation of the arts that stays with me to this very day. And in addition to my current work with the commission, I served on, I served on several community organization, organization boards including In Street Village, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a nonprofit that provides permanent supportive housing for women in the city, and the Ellington Fund, an organization that raises funds to, to support programs and activities at the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. For the past two years, I have been the spring benefit chair for the Mosaic Theater, and uh, a member of the Woolly Mammoth Spring Gala committees uh, in the past. Prior to these roles, I served on the board of Martha's Table for over 18 years. Taking an active role in a variety of community organizations has opened my eyes to all the district has to offer and my experiences continue to inform my work on the commission. I was first appointed to the commission in 2015. Since that time, I've served on the nominating committee, the grants committee, and served as vice chair for two years. 
As a member of the Grants Committee, I am committed to ensuring that there is inclusion, diversity, and equity in the granting process. I have also served as a commissioner convener on many panels during my five years on the commission. Most recently, I served on the search committee for our new executive director, where we interviewed several candidates and made a final selection for that critical position. Arts and uh, cultural production accounts for roughly 8.4% of the district's local economy. In response to COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, the Grants Committee recommended relief funding in support of artists and arts organizations. This recommendation was approved by commissioners and was implemented very quickly. I am, I am very much aligned with the Commission for Washington, D.C. to be a world cultural destination for the Council for all of its efforts to maintain and increase the funding of the Commission. The residents of the District of Columbia continue to benefit greatly from your efforts. Um, we also just recently uh, found out that we were voted um, number four in the country uh, for large um, cities. Uh, uh, recently, I think it was yesterday, we found out. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. This concludes my testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Banks. You were breaking up there near the end. What were you saying about uh, number four? DC is number four. It's D.C., uh, Maryland, and Virginia, that area was voted number four, uh, and let me find out exactly. I can go ahead. So Southern, Methodist, Southern Methodist University has like an arts vibrancy um, survey that they do every year, and D.C. is number four in the arts vibrancy for large communities in, in uh, arts. That's pretty good, isn't it? Very good. It was based on 2019 numbers, though, but um, hopefully, you know, with this, we'll step up, we'll, we'll still be uh, up there, number four, or higher. Um, so let me see, I do have some questions. Uh, some of them are my standard questions that I ask at any um, confirmation hearing. Uh, Ms. Floyd and Ms. Banks, and Ms. Rooney, you're each up for reappointment. So you've served on the commission for a while. Um, I'll start with, with Ms. Floyd. Um, roughly how much time do you put in uh, a week or a month? And why do you want to continue? Um, I would say probably six to eight hours a month, um, not counting commission meetings that we might have. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? And why do you want to continue serving? Oh, I mean, I, I was, the arts is my testimony, right? I, I grew up in the arts. I lost my mother at a young age. Um, the arts is who I am and how I got to be where I am today. And so I want to be able to be that same voice for those who feel, uh, you know, underrepresented within the arts. And I want to, I want to make sure that we are able to truly be equitable in the arts in DC. Uh, you said about six to eight hours plus meetings. How long do the meetings last? Um, we probably an hour and a half to two hours, I would say a month, depending on if we have to vote on uh, grants or not. Some uh, are shorter than others. Uh, Ms. Rooney, you're being reappointed. You've been on the board. Uh, how much time do you spend? You're muted. I'm on a number of different committees, so I would say that I probably spend about between 12 and 15 hours um, a week. A week? Yes. And you may have touched on this as well in your statement, but why do you want to continue serving? Why would I like to continue? Well, part of it is that I feel as if um, 
uh, people with disabilities probably are not as well represented um, in the commission's um, activities as we probably could be. And um, I'm interested in uh, trying to bring those sorts of um, uh, uh, activities to the forefront of the commission going forward. Thank you. Ms. Banks, you're up for reappointment. Yes. So you've been on, on the commission for a while. About how much time do you spend? Well, during the, the uh, 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 panels, it's more because we spend eight hours uh, convening panels. So that uh, on, per, uh, on, a, on a, any given day. And so um, I would say, and being on uh, different committees, at least um, maybe like 20, 20 to 24 hours a month. And why do you want to be reappointed? Well, I would like to continue the work that I've uh, done with uh, the uh, with the um, commission, especially now that we're we've gone through some uh, diversity and equity and inclusion um, initiatives that we're, we're uh, task force. And I'm, I'm really, I want to continue to see where we go with the, with the uh, funding of artists and public art. And I just really enjoy being on the commission and being a part of these uh, decisions. Thank you. So for each of you, and then don't worry, the uh, new appointments, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, Ms. Floyd, uh, Ms. Rooney, Ms. Banks, knowing how much time you have spent, do you have the time to continue serving? Ms. Floyd? Yes, definitely. Ms. Rooney? Yes. And Ms. Banks? Yes. Okay, now I asked these questions in this order on purpose. So Ms. Fitzpatrick, you've heard about how much time it takes. Do you have that time to serve? I do, Chairman Mendelson. And Mr. Torres, do you have that time to serve? And you know you're muted, so I can read your lips, but nobody can hear you. <laughs> Mute? Okay. As I said, yes, I am aware, and I would be very glad to, to, to invest that time. And Ms. Sims, you know I'm going to ask you that question. You've heard how much time folks are spending. Do you have that time to spend? Yes, I do. Uh, now, several of you have had some relations with the district government. Um, and you also have been involved with um, some arts groups in the city. So I want to ask about conflicts of interest. Um, and I'm not going to, well, how do I phrase this? Um, do you, if, if there is a conflict of interest or a possible conflict of interest, what will you do? And I'm going to kind of go in reverse order. Ms. Banks? So always since I've been there, we've had uh, situations like this where many of our, our members our commissioners are involved with other groups. So we always, if we feel a conflict, we recuse ourselves from the voting. And um, more recently, we've been doing blind voting so that there isn't that kind of uh, thing, that th that kind of thing doesn't come up often because we're, we're, we don't see the organizations that we're voting for. Uh, Ms. Sims. If there, if there was a possible conflict, how would you uh, handle it? I would definitely recuse, recuse myself, yes. If you suspected, would you ask uh, like the general counsel or the executive director, is this something I need to recuse myself on? If I knew right off, I would recuse myself automatically. And if I needed to inquire, I would, yes. Uh, Mr. Torres. I would certainly make it known that there's a possible conflict uh, and recuse myself if necessary, but I, I do not think I would have any right now to think of. Um, Ms. Rooney. Uh, yes, I, I don't think I have any um, conflicts of interest, but I would certainly state if I did and recuse myself uh, as needed. Uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick. I would recuse myself and I would make it known that there is a conflict of interest. 
And Ms. Floyd. Yes, I would recuse myself. I have no problems doing that. Uh, now, I had sent each of you uh, some questions in advance of the hearing, and even though this is one of the questions I always ask at the hearings, are you current on your taxes and obligations to the district and federal governments? Ms. Floyd? Yes. Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Rooney? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. Ms. Sims? No, and I have indicated that we are in the process of, of uh, refiling some of our taxes. So they will be, oh. we don't owe, but we are, our forms are being refiled. So you're in the process of being in compliance? Right, yes. Sir. Uh, and Ms. Banks? Yes. Um, Now, uh, let me see, a year ago, a little more than a year ago, in fact, a year and a half ago, um, the council moved to make the commission independent. Uh, and there was some controversy around that, as those of you who have been on the commission know. Um, just, I'm not looking for long answers here, but uh, your views with regard to independence and that controversy a year ago. I'm going to start with the current members and then I'll ask the new members, the, the new nominations. Um, and I'm going to go in reverse order. Ms. Banks? Um, I, I think it was a great uh, move to become independent. I think it gives us more autonomy. Like I mentioned before, the task force that we um, uh, developed and um, so we, I, I think it's a great uh, initiative and I I feel like it was it was uh, well needed. Uh, Ms. Rooney, I agree. I feel as if it was a good uh, a good move, and um, and I appreciate feeling as if we are above politics and um, really uh, committed to the, the uh, citizens of this of of the District of Columbia. And Ms. Floyd. Yes, I was um, for the independence of the agency. So I think that was a, a great direction that we're moving, we move towards. And um, do you think so far it's working well? I think there can be some language around um, clear expectations. I think a lot of things that come up in commission conversations um, is that, you know, we are pseudo independent. Um, so uh, being completely transparent with you, I think there, I think we need to figure out where exactly we're moving towards during this. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let me ask the uh, the new nominees, um, Ms. Fitzpatrick, do you have any views to the extent that you're aware of the controversy? I, mean, I don't feel that I'm close enough to it, Mr. Chairman. I, I will say that I did follow it in the press. Um, and I think the negative publicity was unfortunate um, because I think my sense of things having been on the task force on diversity since it's early summer is that everybody is really committed to um, advancing progress with arts funding and uh, many of us are committed to addressing inequities um, and I think that um, sometimes those kinds of publicity moments I think you just froze either that or I'm waiting for you to finish your sentence are a distraction and sometimes to just Ms. Fitzpatrick, we've kind of lost the last uh, maybe 40 seconds of what you were saying. Yeah, what I was saying is I did follow it in the press and I thought the publicity was, um, it seemed uh, to be somewhat negative as I recall. 
um, um, which I think is unfortunate because I think we're all committed to positive advancement for the, the arts community in the district. So I don't know that it reflected that commitment. Um, Mr. Torres. Well, provided that funding <clears throat> is still considered priority by the executive as well as the council, I think having an independent agency is very important in creating a certain level of aut autonomy uh, and, and allowing for creativity of, of, of the body that you have actually assigned to this particular task. It's important that engagement continues in diverse communities and communities that have been somewhat neglected um, devoid of politics. However, you can't deny that politics is always going to be part of the formula simply because of the funding comes through obviously um, engaging those who make the funding possible. But uh, independence, I think, is a very important factor. And Ms. Sims. I, I agree in general. I think that the move to be independent um, would have been a uh, is a good one, um, but I haven't. I wasn't close enough to it to know exactly, uh, you know, all the details. I would, I would say so. I haven't really formulated a strong opinion. Well, I will just say, as an understatement, it was an exciting time. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, I guess I would ask this of the three who are being re nominated for reappointment, um, how would you describe, I'm not sure I wanna ask it that way. I wanna ask about in, how the members of the board get along. Um, how do you think the members get along and is there anything that could be improved? Um, Ms. Banks? Um, as all groups, we do have our differences, but I think that um, we uh, discuss them and we come together around whatever votes we have. At, uh, so we figure out how to make it happen. And so I, um, you know, I think we're, we get along great. Um, that's just me. <laughs> um. Miss Miss Rooney, uh, I I would say that um, our chair Kay Kendall is incredibly um, warm, and um, she and also um, Haran uh, Sarek um, really does foster our new um, our new uh, head of the um, agency. Uh, does. In, is incredibly uh, good at fostering um, a wonderful sense of inclusion. And so I think because of that, we are able to overcome the differences that we have with, um, with different board members. And I think with any group, you're bound to have people who, uh, uh, who disagree. Um, but I would say that the chair, um, Kay Kendall and um, Haran Zarek do a wonderful job of being examples of, of, um, of civility and uh, integrity. Uh, Ms. Floyd. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say we get along, but I think we all know with our, what our North Star is and our purposes for our community. Um, and we work towards that. So, yeah, and we're growing together. <laughs> is growing together a good thing? Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, so several of you in your statements talked about, uh, and I don't think this is the word you use, but it's the word I'll use, helping the little guys, the small artists, so folks who um, just need some additional support to, um, to succeed. Uh, but I'm going to, even though you might have touched on it, I'm going to ask each of you, um, how, do, how do you think we can best help the little guys? Uh, let me see. I keep going from front to back or back to front. I'm going to start in the middle. Miss, um, Miss Rooney? I think that a lot of our, our grant giving is probably the biggest um, 
program that we have in terms of, of supporting um, supporting the arts and just being sure that we are focused on um, giving across the board, not only to the big organizations, but also focusing on the smaller organizations and also the smaller indiv the individuals who um, could use the support uh, and individual artists who could use the support. Mr. Torres. Well, I, I believe uh, that first of all, one has to recognize that I think that the commission does uh, that artists, uh, new and, and developing artists in particular, are, are, are basically the future of the arts scene in Washington, D.C. And to a great extent, they, they should be supported uh, vigorously uh, by, by creating forums of education, forums where they could actually exhibit their work, uh, places where they could actually get exposure and get to be known, because that really is the food for the soul for many artists. Ms. Fitzpatrick. One of the things I've learned at working on the task force, which is chaired by Reggie Van Lee, uh, who's done a magnificent job, I, I would say, um, is that we have, uh, I think, insufficient data and analytics to really understand the scope of our challenge. Um, so today, it's very difficult to understand, um, for example, the percentage of uh, people of color that we give grants to, or what their socioeconomic status is, or even where they are within the city. So one of the things we're doing as a task force, Mr. Chairman, is getting a really good understanding of what we're trying to solve for, understanding the need in the community, and then making recommendations to the commission about how to effectively address those needs. Um, I will say I'm, I'm married to a professional musician and I know how difficult it is to earn a living um, as a professional musician. And I know how hard musicians across the city and other artists uh, in different genres are working. And so I'm really looking forward to, um, if confirmed, playing a part on the commission is to understanding where those quote little guys and gals are and how we can be most supportive. I think because if we can lift them up, the city as a whole will benefit from that effort. Um, Ms. Sims? I think that professional development is, is a really important way in addition to grant making. And I think that, um, you know, I think when the pandemic hit, particularly with artists that, that I work with, I found the need to talk to them about financial planning and, and budgeting and, and, and how to prepare for situations like this the next time because they clearly weren't prepared this time. And so we did whatever we could to, to kind of keep them financially engaged but we also help them set up retirement plans um, so that you know, they just could start to feel a little more secure. I think uh, helping them to figure out ways to pivot um, and how to use streaming resources, how to, um, how to leverage the internet and social media to, uh, and, and e-commerce during this time so that they could have additional streams of income. Uh, and I think that just the overall business of art is something that would, would help us, you know, supplement the grant um, making process. So those are, that, that's one of the things that I think would, should be. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Banks. So being very, very specific. Um, my uh, husband collects uh, street art, and I was talking to the uh, to Gretchen Warden, who is our chair of our uh, grants and panels, and I said, "How do we get someone like a, a street artist to apply for a grant?" And she immediately said, "We need to form a grant just for that that genre of art." So just trying to uh, meet the artists where they are, find them first. Uh, I, I was really proud that the commission uh, started a new grant for GoGo -Go artists, which uh, GoGo -Go is now our official music for the city. And this is the first year we've kind of recognized or been able to give a grant to uh, 
go-go artists because they're they're not a they're a for-profit kind of business but figuring out how to uh make it so they can apply for grants and so just trying to meet the artists where they are the smaller unrecognized artists where they are and miss floyd yeah um First, I, I just wanted to address that, that there are no little guys. I think everyone in the arts community is powerful. It's just that we have to be able to provide those resources to them. And so I think we need to look at um, redistribution um, of our funding. We need to look at our funding formulas. Uh, we need to ask the community what they want and then provide those tools for them so that we can support them as best as we can. Well, I think that it may actually tie into my uh, next question. There also has been some controversy over the last year or so of the funding formulas that um, the council put into the legislation that made the commission independent. Uh, do you have strong views about that? And uh, if so, what are they? And maybe Ms. Floyd, I'll start with you since I think that's where you were. Yeah, I mean, um... 28% of the funding goes to a lot of the bigger organizations. And I think that's not equitable. Um, I think there needs to be a, a examination of, of that funding and making sure that we are redistributing and making sure that we are investing in communities um, around the city and making sure that we are supporting folks who don't have access to as, the resources that those bigger institutions might have. Um, Ms. Fitzpatrick, do you have a view of it? I do. You know, I think my view would be different if we weren't in a pandemic, to be honest with you. I think we need as a, as a body to really assess the impact on our arts economy uh, during the pandemic, because I think organizations, large and small, are really, really challenged right now. Um, so I, th I think that, you know, as a blanket statement is absolutely true. As I mentioned, I serve on the board of Arena Stage. And um, you know, that's the, 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 uh, the ticket sales are not coming and the, the stages are dark and that's challenging, right? But as it relates to the, 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 what we describe as the cohort of those large organizations that are getting funded through the legislation, I, you know, I will say through my work on the task force that there is a perception out there that there was a lack of transparency around arriving at that funding mechanism and that um, some folks in the community have voiced a concern that they um, that there isn't an equal playing field and an ability to compete for a very you know confined amount of funding, um, and there's concern about that. And I think that we have an obligation to hear that concern and to assess um, you know what the cohort of funders um, how that how they were selected. Um, and uh, what obligations they have is getting that funding. For example, if you're going to dedicate a certain amount of money to certain organizations and limit it, you know, I would expect that they would uh, adhere to values that the council holds dear, like having diverse boards, having diverse workforce, making sure that they're uh, working with organizations that are smaller um, and who need nurturing and mentorship. So I think there's a lot of opportunity as it relates to that funding construct. And what I've heard in a few brief conversations on the task force is that there is community concern about it. Uh, Ms. Rooney, do you have a view of this? Yes, I think the commission is becoming aware that this is a concern for, um, for the community. And so um, I do believe that they are trying in a variety of ways to, be, to begin to address um, this issue and, uh, and, and figure out ways in which things can be more equitable and, um, and, uh, and, and fair. Uh, Mr. Torres? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think COVID-19 has forever changed basically the perspective as to what is fair and equitable. Uh, and it's made it very, very obvious, particularly with communities of color feeling very left out and alienated, if you wish. Um, it, it is, as funding it becomes available, which is a challenge for creating those funds to begin with, 
funding, particularly for larger organizations, should be made conditional that they are working with smaller organizations and diverse organizations and diversify their boards as well as uh, who they support and the educational programs that they bring to the community so that in essence, all together, we, we raise the, uh, how would you say, the arts understanding and, and, and support uh, as, as a total community. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sims. I, I agree with what Hector was saying and that uh, COVID-19 has shifted the way that we need to think about it. And I think these large organizations do need to be, um, not only have some, some, some additional criteria for, or conditions for how they use the money uh, and so that they begin to engage some of these smaller organizations within the community. Uh, if, if, if they're going to get the lion's share of the, the funding and the way it, is distributed needs to be distributed internally needs to be changed or looked at. I I also think, Mr. Mendelson, that I that um, that there's a crisis among large and small, and I think that we need a plan to address the need. I think these organizations, many of them that um, that we're talking about, the larger ones, for example, are significant employers in the district. And so I worry about those folks that are being furloughed and losing their health insurance and other things. And so um, I think it's a difficult time for everyone. And I think because the arts and our arts economy is so important, um, both for tourism and, and for the kind of the livelihood of the city, but also as an employment driver, I think um, it's concerning. Uh, that the ticket sales don't exist and that people have had to shutter their productions. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you know this better than, than most. There is a sense of urgency out there about how sustainable this is. Uh, and Ms. Banks. So I'm in agreement with what it seems like we're all aligned on the same uh, page uh, regarding this issue. Um, so I, I'm in agreement with what everyone said about the larger organizations um, mentoring smaller ones and also just maybe even revisiting the, the funding structure um, to make it more equitable to smaller organizations as well. Um, thank you. I don't think I have any more questions, but I, I think that because I asked that last question, I probably should uh, I'll say something about it. This is an opportunity for me to speak to a third, a third of the uh, commission. Um, what we've tried to do in the council, because all this came from the council, is uh, over the last several years, bring some order to the funding that we do, as well as increase the funding. Uh, what had been happening for many years, and some of you who've been on the commission may remember this, is that we would appropriate a budget like, let's say, $20 million, and then we would earmark about half of that. And we would earmark it to those groups who came in and talked to us. So I don't want to name any council members by name, uh, but uh, an organization, usually a large organization, because it's able to lobby, comes in and talks to a council member, says, I've got this capital campaign. I need some uh, money. It's a $10 million campaign. If you help with $2 million, uh, that will um, enable us to uh, get the rest of the funding because we can go out to donors and say, look, the city's giving us some money. And in that process, we were earmarking maybe half of the commission's budget. And we were doing it in a very haphazard way. And when I say haphazard, I mean, maybe I could say ad hoc. The organizations come in and talk with us. And whoever talked to us, talked to a member. And, and every, if you think about it, every arts organization's request is uh, legitimate and, um, you know, a bona fide request. And uh, so then a member puts the earmark in and uh, that's where the budget went, about half of it. So what we've done over the last few years is to try to get away from that. And uh, the deal, if I can put it that way, was 
the arts groups, the big groups can't come in and talk to us about earmarks. And in return, they get this, if they qualify, that cohort has a qualifications. I think their budget has to be, their operating budget has to be over a certain amount for, I think it's three years. And um, uh, if they qualify, then they get a percentage of the budget, which if I remember correctly is about 28%. If that 28% works out to be, I'm having to do some quick math here, uh, $10 million. And there are 10 organizations, they split it evenly. If it's 20 organizations, they split it evenly and get less. And they don't come to us and they don't get any earmarks. At the oversight hearing that we had in June, the testimony was that in the past, these organizations through the ad hoc process were getting maybe a third of the commission's budget. And now they're getting less than that, but they don't compete with the other organizations. And then what we also did was we said, if I remember correctly, about 50% of your grants budget goes to everybody else. And that's, um, uh, you know, the what I called the small guys, although somebody said rightly that there are no small guys. Um, the, um, and the big, Big uh, organizations can't touch any of that. And then there was a small percent that went to humanities, a percent that goes to capital. And I think I left out one category, uh, but that's how we got there. And um, I'm not saying I wanna do this, but we could get rid of all the formulas, but then it's back to everybody competing and the big guys who have the greater ability to compete are gonna be muscling out everybody else, or at least muscling a greater advantage. So that's how we got there. But I get that there's some controversy around this. And I'm just thinking through my um, thinking that uh, maybe there needs to be more discussion about this. And maybe I'm um, not promising this and it's not for me to promise anyway, but maybe there needs to be something like a um, a meeting or two of all the commission um, with uh, the representatives of the large cohort and others uh, to uh, kind of just discuss this and sort it out. Uh, because I can tell you that when that, those formulas first came to us, which was, I believe in 2018, we may not have adopted in them, but in 2018, there was consensus around it. By 2019, which was when we also uh, adopted the independence for the commission, there was no controversy at the hearing. I mean, there was just witness after witness who was saying, thank God we've got some order and some peace to all this. Uh, so maybe we need to um, further that discussion. Um, I do not have any more questions for you. Uh, I don't wanna prolong this hearing, but I will ask if any of the six of you have any questions understand if you have questions that prolongs this and you can't go home. I'm not seeing any We're questions. We're at home. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, was that, did, did somebody want to say something? I, I would, um, this is Hector Torres. First of all, yeah. thank you very much for your time and, and, and for asking these very important relevant questions. I still am an advocate for um, when dealing with large organizations to have conditional funding from um, uh, how would you say gains made by smaller and larger organizations by working together. So that really is a very important component of allowing the smaller guys to benefit from at least the knowledge and understanding of the arts industry by the larger organizations. That shared knowledge is really very, very vital for uh, smaller organizations and even independent artists, as you would find. So thank you very much for listening to us. I truly appreciate your attention. Sure, and I agree with that. And uh, I think several, several of you made that comment as well. Uh, so let me just close out this hearing. The, uh, and I have a, another hearing to follow this. So I'm gonna adjourn this hearing in a minute and I'm gonna stay on and I'm sort of saying this for Council Member Trayon White who's joined us, uh, that we will start the next hearing as soon as cable TV, if they're still with us, um, can set up. The, um, this has been a hearing on nominations by the mayor to the Commission on Arts and Humanities. 
Uh, the record in this matter will close at uh, noon on November 9th, Monday, November 9th. Uh, I wanna thank each of you nominees for your willingness to serve, to those of you who have served, thank you for your service. And uh, thank you all of you for your willingness to serve going forward. I should just check, Councilmember White, did you have questions for any of these folks or you're here for the next hearing? I am here for the next hearing, but I wanna thank everyone for serving. And I do it as a former uh, grantee uh, of the Arts and Humanities Commission. And I know it was beneficial for me trying to serve and do work in the ward just to make more of that affordable, that funding available to the smaller organizations in an equitable way. And I do agree with the partnerships which is also crucial because it helps them to learn from a lot of organizations and help with the capacity building and networking. Um, because most of the time for me, <clears throat> being a small organization, I was running a, a, a organization and doing the work at the same time, uh, which is burdensome. And I, and I heard uh, the question was about figuring out uh, what uh, ethnicities uh, benefit from, the, from the, the grants. I know we had to do reports every so often to reflect uh, data information, um, geographics and population served and age, every, everything. Um, so I'm not sure if that went away or what types of grants are we referring to, but I do remember that process as well, which we collect that data to give back to the grantee, so. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, so I need to say one other thing before I adjourn this hearing. The live feed on cable TV and the DC Council website will stop at six. For members of the public watching, the next hearing will be live streamed on chairmanmendelson.com slash live. Uh, we will stop for a minute after we gavel out this hearing and then gavel in and start the next hearing. So again, thank you to everybody. The time is 5.58 and this